you doing? Good morning and welcome to Greater New Hope Ministries, Church of Christ Written in Heaven, where our pastor is none other than Bishop Marshall L. Graham and our elect lady is Lady Sandra Graham. Thank you so much for tuning in for our Sunday School lesson this morning. I'm Prophetess Ginger Taylor and uh, I'll be your facilitator slash teacher this morning. So um, if you have your lessons with you this morning, I'd ask that you turn to Mark chapter 14 if you do not have a Sunday School lesson. Um, that is where our, our Sunday school will be taken from this morning. It's going to be Mark chapter 14, and we'll be focusing on ver verses 43 through 52. So let's pray before we get started this morning. It's such a beautiful day, and there's so much going on in our land um, that I just feel the need for us to pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you, Father, for life, health, and strength. We thank you for repentance. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for conversion. We thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus. We thank you for all the things that you've done, God. There's so much that we have to be thankful for. And God, we pray special prayers and blessings for those, Lord God, who have weathered this storm um, over the past week, the past few days, God, uh, with inclement weather, those that are homeless, those are without. And we ask, oh God, that you send your angels of protection to continue, Lord God, to wrap your arms around them, God, and help us as believers to be used as catalyst of faith and provision for them, those that are without, Father. We thank you again for your many, many blessings, God, and we ask that you be with us on this morning as we dive into your word, God, and um, you just sup with us as we sup with you. These and many other mercies we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we're looking at a lesson, and the lesson is entitled, Jesus Stands Trial. Now, as I studied this lesson, it really, there's some things, one thing that stood out to me over everything, and you may see some different things, but I, I want to point out some things throughout this morning's lesson to um, just share with you. And we'll start in the lesson that says, Jesus displayed humility in the darkest hours of his life. The overview of the lesson is this. Today's lesson focuses on an especially low point in Jesus' life, betrayal by one of the twelve. So we're looking at before Jesus even goes to uh, Calvary, before he goes through that point in place of crucifixion, we see some things taking place. And one of the scriptures that comes to mind is how Jesus, he was faced with temptations and sin like every other man, but he was yet without sin. And one of the things that he faced was betrayal. He, he faced um, somebody turning their back on him that was walking with him and in in, in one regard, seemingly close to him. The commentary goes on to say that while Jesus was aware of his ultimate fate and suffering he would endure, the act of betrayal must still have proven to be a great discouragement to him. And when I think about the word betrayal, that word just stood out to me. Um, there's nothing like believing that you have uh, the friendship of someone or the confidence of someone and um, all the other things that go along with relationship building. When you feel as though a person is walking with you, talking with you, eating with you, um, spending time with you, and, and basically you're not having any disagreements, you're not going head to toe and, and, and not falling out with each other on a day-to-day -day regular basis, one would think that, okay, we have a pretty good solid foundation in terms of a relationship. So when a person turns on you, I'm talking about turns on you to the point of it cost you your life. Man, I cannot even begin to fathom how one human being really deals with another human being when something like that happens. Now, here's the thing. For most of us, we don't deal with that type of betrayal. We, we for, the, for the most part, I know that there are some people that are in arenas where those types of things happen, where your life is put on the line. This is what we're talking about, his life put on the line. So before he even got to Calvary, you've got a person that has spent numerous amount of hours and times listening to Jesus teach, listening to, watching Jesus, observing him, heal the sick, raise the dead, do things that, that, that he's basically, um, you're like, wow, I'm in the inner circle of Jesus? Can you imagine? Now, because he was God and man, Jesus, I don't know even how to, to word this, but because he was 
Father, Son, and Holy Ghost all wrapped up in one. Because he's a part of the Trinity, let me say it like that. That's more politically correct. But because he's a part of the Trinity, perhaps um, he was able to, to just process it a little bit differently or, or better. Let me use that word, better than I could. But when you put it in 21st century and you swap places with our Savior, and somebody betrays you to the point of death, you can't tell me that you're not having a bad week, a bad day. So the commentary goes on to say, however, as disheartening as it must have been, the betrayal of Judah sets in motion what would be the most significant event ever to take place with respect to the redemption of mankind, the death and resurrection of Christ. While we often focus on Christ's suffering in terms of his crucifixion, we will see that his suffering started before the crucifixion itself and included betrayal, ridicule, beatings, Peter's denial, all of which Jesus suffered on our behalf. So I looked up the word betrayal just because it stands out to me. I tell you, I'm full right now because it stands out to me. There are so many other ways that we feel as though friendships and relationships get um torn apart. But when you look at the word betrayal, it says the act of exposing or delivering someone to an enemy through treachery or disloyalty. It also says that it means the act of disappointing a person's trust, hopes, and expectations. The act of revealing in favorable in violation or confidence. So you know, when, when you think that you have a friend, I, I love that hymn that says, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. You know, when we know that we have a friend in Jesus, who wants to think that the one that we believe in, that we trust in, that has given his life for us could ever betray us? That, that is such a profound word that, that when you look at that happening in the life of of us as human beings, and you're walking alongside, whether it be your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister, your friend, a relative, betrayal is such a harsh thing, but Jesus dealt with that. He dealt with the betrayal of someone that walked with him, spent intimate time and fellowship with all of the disciples right there, and, and here's somebody that just came, and, and I know it was a part of the plan, but can you imagine knowing that this is something you have to go through. All of this is before he stands to trial and he's getting ready to go to trial. And you've got somebody that has basically sold him out and for what? The golden text is from, taken from Mark 14, 60 and 61. And it says, the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus saying, answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. So when we look at the scripture in its totality, it says Jesus betrayed and arrested. Now, the scripture reads, immediately while he yet spake cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the scribes and elders. Now I'm going to stop right there. These, these are every, this is everybody that represents the, the ecclesia, the, the big group. The, the, these are supposed to be the leaders of the church, the leaders, the leaders, mind you. You've got the chief, priests, the scribes, and the elders. They're leading the people. Okay? They're coming now in this mob. <laughs> and these are leaders are who's supposed to be over the religious sect. And it says, and that he betrayed, he that betrayed him had given them a token saying, whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Take him and lead him away safely. So Judas is basically saying, now y'all hold off because the one that I kiss, that's the one. That's, that's the one that you're going to need to get. He's going to, he said it for Jesus. And he's giving him a little signal. I, I just want you to start paying attention. This, the Bible declares that we need to watch as well as pray. That we wouldn't be ignorant of the enemy's devices. So these are lessons that we need to extract from this lesson. There's some things in life, I'm going to tell you now, a lot of folks that's walking along the side of us, but betrayal is a sneaky character. It's, it's sneaky. It's, it's not anything that just comes up to you and say, hi, I'm, I'm going to betray you. It doesn't happen like that. Jesus knew because he was Jesus. He was God incarnate. 
But we need to make sure that we are learning lessons from what God has placed here. We don't have to recreate the wheel. There are some folks that's going to walk closely with you. And I'm going to tell you now, if it happened to Jesus, it's about going to happen to us. At some point in life, there are going to be people that, that will just as soon sell you out. You better watch as well as pray. Okay? And it goes on to say, as, And as soon as he was come, he goeth straightway to him and saith, Master, Master. And he kissed him. And they laid their hands on him and took him away. <laughs> I mean, just process that. Judas says, I'm going to, I'm going to, and for, what did he do it for? Was it 30 pieces of silver? Is that what it was? I mean, really? All this in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And some people will choose that over, over being in the kingdom of Christ. They would rather be in the kingdom of darkness. Let's look at the commentary. The commentary says Judas was one of the 12 chosen to follow Jesus throughout his earthly ministry. He arranged with the religious leaders to betray Jesus, and he now leads a contingent of men carrying clubs and swords intended to arrest him. First of all, I mean, when you think about Jesus and what he had done, what had he done that would warrant people going with clubs and, and swords to go and arrest him. I mean, I can see if we were going after, you know, Freddy Krueger, a mass murderer, or somebody off of uh, NSI or NCSI, whatever it's called. You know, you got some of these crazy people that, that warrant you coming after them. But he wasn't, he wasn't even a violent person. I mean, to me, I'm like, okay, hold up with the swords and the, and the clubs. I mean, what, what y'all doing? It, it didn't even require that kind of activity. It just did. And it says that Judas has arranged to kiss him to identify him to the posse. Okay, this sign was given for Jesus' betrayal. It's supposed to represent love and affection. Now, let me pause there. Uh, you better watch some of the kisses. <laughs> watch some of the kisses that you're getting. I'm telling you, watch as well as pray. Betrayal is real. And nowadays, when it boils down to things, when it concerns your belief in Jesus Christ as a Christian follower, people are not playing the games that they once used to play. People are doing overt and covert things. And so now it just behooves us to recognize, know them that you're laboring among. Know them. Know them. Because the same things that happen, there's nothing new under the sun. There is absolutely nothing new under the sun. I don't know why God would stick this Sunday school lesson in the, in the middle of the winter for us to, but I, I tell you what, is there for a reason? Jesus suffered before he even went to the, the cross. And so we're admonished to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Before you even take up your cross real good, you better watch out for things like betrayal. Because guess what? The enemy of your soul has a mandate. His mandate is to steal, kill, and to destroy. And when you take that one little scripture and you remind yourself that it's not arbitrary, it's not for folks out there, it's for you too. It's for me too. So a kiss, something that's supposed to be symbolic of uh, love and affection, was given as a sign to turn over our Savior. It goes on to say, yet here, far from any form of love for Jesus, a kiss sets in motion the beginning of his suffering and ultimately his crucifixion. Following Judas's kiss of betrayal, Jesus having been identified to the mob accompanying Judas is seized. Ironically, just a few verses earlier, his disciples are shown to have been unable to even stay awake and pray with Jesus during his time of need. That's in earlier verses, in verses 32 through 42. Jesus goes to pray, and while he's out there praying, he's got two of the disciples there that's supposed to stay and, and watch, keep watch, and they're supposed to pray, and they couldn't pray for an hour. Let me tell you something. There has been a myriad of uh, conference calls, prayer phone calls uh, for us to join in on since the pandemic. There were a few people, quite a few, that were doing like prayer conference calls and everything prior to the pandemic. But since post-pandemic, there have been, I'm talking about pop-up calls for prayer calls and everything. We need to make sure that we are learning to intercede. If we have not learned since March of last year, 
and we're heading into March of 2021, how to at least tarry, how to at least pray for one hour. Jesus is like, could you not tarry for one hour? So before Judas even betrayed him, you had disciples that all that they were asked to do was just pray. Stand guard, pray. Could you not pray for one hour? Do you know how disappointing that must have been? It wouldn't have circumvented what was going to happen. The plan of God was still going to be carried out. Judas was still going to betray Jesus. However, comma, in the whole scheme of things, can you imagine what might have happened a little bit differently if they had just prayed for one hour? You never know because they didn't do it. Now, what about us? There's some things that if we would take the time and begin to learn how to pray, learn how to press in for longer than just a couple of minutes, I believe that we can set some things in motion that would probably keep the enemy at bay. The commentary goes on to say, but now they appear so committed to him that one draws a sword in order to protect Jesus from his captors. That's when Peter cut off his ear, <laughs> cut off one of the ears of the soldier. John identifies the soldier, I'm sorry, the disciple who wielded the sword as Peter. So that was Peter cutting off people's ears. Okay, Peter, don't cut off anybody's ears. Just, just pray. That's all I need you to she said, put the soldier's ear back in place. I'm just saying, we've got to be able to get disciplined in those things that are going to help us. What are you saying, prophet? I'm saying that Peter was quick to take out the sword. Listen, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Our weapons are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Peter cut off the brother's ear, but look at this. That didn't help anything. Had he prayed, he may have been able to convert the soldier. Had he prayed, you, you, we just don't know what would happen if we would do the spiritual thing, the thing that makes no sense to the onlooker that does not know God. But those that say that we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, if we would do those things that God has positioned for us to do, we're going to see God's, his, the thing that he wants to manifest. Not just the fact that, okay, you come to get my boy, shoot, I'm going to cut off the ear. That ain't helping anything. In fact, it probably could have made matters worse. Thanks be to God, Jesus was able to put the man's ear back on. <laughs> but in the whole scheme of things, we've got to learn how to use our spiritual weapons. Praying does so much more than what the natural eye can see. But they couldn't even pray for one hour. They couldn't pray for one hour. What about us? Are we in a position, are we in a place in our walk with Christ that we've learned how to discipline ourselves? to pray beyond just the surface, to go into the spiritual realms and call down things from heaven, to have the heavens open up and God respond to our very heart cry. In another point, and a bit of irony, Mark mentions that the following, Peter, his bold actions, okay, they all forsook him and fled. They all forsook him and fled in Mark 14 and 50. That's what it says. I want to read this out of a different version. It says, yeah, they all deserted him and ran away. Now a certain man wearing nothing but linen cloth was following him. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth behind and ran away naked. Now, you know, that stood out to me because I had never seen that before. And I was like, well, who was the dude that ran away naked? You know, all you ever hear about are the seven sons of Sceva. And they get beat up because they thought that they had some powers that they didn't have. But I had never seen this the person that was out there amongst Jesus and the crowd that came to get him, and then when they noticed, looked at him, he's scared and run. Now, when you study that out, it never really tells you who it is, but some commentary says it may have been Mark. Isn't that interesting? Another disciple, presumably, he runs away scared and runs away naked. Keep my clothes, I'm out. Y'all, we've gotta be built up in this season that if we get to the point where our, our uh, faith is put to the test, will we stand for Christ or will we run away naked? When our faith is put to the test, will we stand for Christ? Are we going to be able to tarry for one hour or will Jesus ask us, could you not pray for one little hour? Could you not do that? Will we stand? When our faith is put to the test, when we're put to the test, will we be able to Stand with Jesus or will we betray him 
like Judas did. These are questions we have to ask ourselves. Whose side are we really on? The scripture goes on, not the scripture, but the commentary says, one moment, heroic measures are taken to defend Jesus, and then, without any mention why, Jesus is left standing alone to face his captors. And that's where we are right now. There, one minute, we're, Jesus, we're with Jesus. One minute, we're right there. Oh, I'm down with the Holy Ghost. I'm me and Jesus. We like this. And in the next minute, as soon as things are not favorable for us as believers, where are we? Are we leaving Jesus over there alone to stand by himself? Or are we, as believers, are we standing with our Christ? Are we standing as Christ's followers? See, it's coming down to the rubber is going to meet the road in this season. It's coming to a place where people are going to identify us. Either we're going to stand with Christ or we're going to betray him. Either we're going to stand with Christ or we're not going to pray for an hour. It's going to, it's going to be something that's tedious to us where we can't do those things that God is calling us to do. Or we're going to run away naked and leave our Christ standing there. I'm telling you, it is so time out for games. It is so so beyond the time of, of playing a religious, uh, traditional kind of thing. Are we going to stand with our Savior? The commentary says that the fear and cowardice of those who flee is heightened by Mark's mention of one who was so afraid that when Jesus was being seized, he managed to pull away. He loses his garment and he runs away naked. Altogether, the picture painted here by Mark is bleak as Jesus is left alone to face the ignominious suffering that lay ahead. There are some things that's going to come that's ahead for the believer. And I believe that God is getting us prepared. He's getting us prepared for a time that's going to come. You know, this is off the beaten path, and I just want to go here. I'm going to put it out there. Um, some of you scholars, y'all may want to text in, write in, or whatever the case may be. But with this pandemic at hand, and it's all over the world, there isn't a cure, so to speak. There's a vaccination. But watch this. When you read in Revelation and it begins to talk about the mark of the beast, how everyone is going to have to have it to be able to get some food to eat, to be able to do anything, to be able to function in society. You never think of that as being a vaccination now, do you? Things that make you go, hmm. But if they mandate this thing for everyone to have to be vaccinated before you can travel, before you can go in stores, before you see, we're not thinking on that level because we're still playing church somewhere. We're still not praying for one hour. We're still running naked away from Christ. We're still doing that betrayal thing where we can't even identify with Christ. I'm just putting it out there. Would you, did you ever think, stop to think that, huh, you know, John on the island of Patmos, could he have identified the mark of the beast as being a vaccination? I'm just saying, it's just something to think about, something to talk about. But if they mandated that everybody had to have it before you could shop in a grocery store, go inside of a place to, to, to obtain any type of uh, services, um, to travel anywhere abroad or stateside, it's just something to think about. Because there are a lot of things that we didn't anticipate. I know what, I wasn't sitting around thinking that one day, ooh, it's going to be a virus this, in, in the land and it affects the whole world. I digress. Before the high priest, Mark 14, 53 through 72. The verses that are outlined here says that they led Jesus away to the high priest. And with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. Now, we really have to pay attention to that because, again, in verse 55, it says, The chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. These are the leaders of the church. These are the religious leaders of the society at that time. And they're looking for somebody to lie. Can we just be honest? That's what they were doing. Looking for somebody that will come up with something to give a reason why, okay, this is not the son of God. He, this man is doing all this fabulous stuff. You know, if you add, let me add my two cents. I ain't trying to add to the word of God, but I'm just telling you what I think. You know, brothers was like, well, you know, he making us look bad because we ain't doing it. <laughs> Truth, facts. Yeah. It, it, it was a little bit more to it than that, that just didn't believe that he wasn't the son of God. 
if it was one of them, you know, if he had given them some shine time, maybe it would have gone differently. I'm just saying. But the scripture goes on to say, stay with the scriptures, prophets, all right. It says that, I'll read it again. The chief priests and all the council sought for the witness against Jesus to pull him to death, to put him to death, and they found none. The high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answereth thou nothing? What is it with these witness against thee, which these witness against thee? Behold, he is, but he held his peace and answered nothing. Jesus didn't respond. He didn't say anything. Against, again, the high priest asked him and said to him, Art thou the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes and saith, What need we any further? What, what need we any further witnesses? Because he just said it out of his own mouth. Okay? Ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. So here's the high priest. The high priest. That says he said it out of his own mouth. He's, he said the thing that we're accusing him of. I'm like, okay. Following the arrest, Jesus is brought before a gathering of religious leaders. The world, the word translated as council in the King James is the term Sanhedrin. This was the official ruling body for the Jews and indicates the seriousness with which these proceedings were taking place. The intent of this group is made plain. All the council sought for witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. Isn't that crazy? Every last one of them. They were, and, and this just goes to show you the power of unity, regardless of which side it's on, whether it's good or bad. Just like the insurrection that took place. Unity for foolishness. I'm, it is what it is. When you unite for something, you, it's a principle of God. A house divided will not stand. When you unite, you'll see progression in a, in a specific area, whatever it is. The commentary says, failing to find any consistent testimony that they could use against Jesus, the high priest himself then begins to question him, hoping to trap him in something he said. That's the thing about truth. When truth is truth, it doesn't need any, it don't need no witnesses. Truth's just going to stand by itself. A lie, got to go grab some buddies, got to go and grab some friends. A lie, you got to chase it down. But truth will stand all by itself. Jesus just spoke truth and it was what it was. It what? Oh, I am. I am who I say I am. It says, after the high priest fails in his attempt to get Jesus to respond to the accusations made against him by the witnesses brought forward, he asked Jesus then uh, directly whether he is Christ, the son of the blessed one. In one of Jesus' clearest de declarations about his identity in all the Gospels, he acknowledges that he is indeed the son of God. This elicits an accusation of blasphemy. It elicits, excuse me, an accusation of blasphemy from those who are listening, who then determine that Jesus' offense is certainly worthy of death. It's really sad to see that, you know, at this point, the, the heights and the depths that people will go to when you mention the name of Jesus and you're standing with him. I want to help somebody today. When you, when you are walking in love and you're doing those things that are godly and Christ-like, you know, you're, you're going to come against some scrutiny because that's what the word declares. You know, if you're going to reign with him, you got to suffer with him. And it's going to happen. Now, I'm not talking about when you have a bad attitude, nasty disposition or whatever, and you're just going to reap what you sow. I mean, if people don't like you, it's not because you're bearing the name of Jesus Christ and living that life. But when you, when you have, you know, just attitude and drama and you keep up mess and lie and all those things that are just, you know, fleshly, ungodly, those things just have repercussions. But when you are living a life and you identify with Christ, trust and believe at some point in our walk, we will come up against some things that, that seemingly is like, God, why is this happening to me? But let me encourage you, just as Jesus did, you stand with truth. You stand with Christ. You don't betray him. Don't, please, Terry, 
for at least an hour. Please pray. And don't run away naked. Stand with the Father. Stand with the Son. Stand with the Holy Ghost. And it says, at this point, Mark shifts the scene from Jesus' appearance before the Sanhedrin to Peter. Now, y'all remember Peter, right? Talked about him a little bit earlier. Peter was the one that was with Jesus when the crowd came up and he cut off the ear of one of the soldiers. Remember that? <laughs> that that's what we're talking about now. And it says that uh, Peter, who is said to have followed Jesus as he was taken from the garden to, his, to the high priest, as Jesus is being questioned inside, Peter was waiting outside in the courtyard, warming himself by the fire. Three times Peter denies knowing Jesus. The final, de the final denial culminating in Peter's answering and swearing that he does not know him. That's in verses 69 through 71. We need to look at that because Peter just showed his, Peter showed his little hind parts. Yes, he did. Um, yeah, let's look at that just a little bit. It says, when the maidservant saw him again, she began to tell those standing nearby, this man is one of them, the one of them. Isn't it something how, you know, people can identify you as Christ, a part of a Christ follower. It is something how they can see there's something about you that's, that's different. You mm, kind of look like one of them, all right? And it says, but again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing there said to Peter, you certainly are one of them since you're also a Galilean. Then he started to curse and swear. Look at there, Peter, hush now. It says, I don't know this man. I don't know what you're talking about. Immediately, a rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered when Jesus had spoken the word to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and he wept. You know, there are times that we're going to be put in spots. And it's my prayer that we continue to pray for one another. Because sometimes, even in our actions, we deny Christ. And, and we're still talking about Jesus getting ready to stand trial. But before he even got to trial, these are some things that he encountered. These are some things that happened, and he was left standing alone. The betrayal of Jesus continues at the Sanhedrin, now chooses to deliver him over to Pilate for judgment. Just as Judas, this is in Mark 15, 1. And it says, just as G Judas, one of Jesus' chosen disciples, betrayed Jesus to the religious leaders, so now Jesus is betrayed once again. The religious leaders of Israel, those charged with caring for the spiritual condition of the people, fail to recognize God as he dwelt among them in the person of his son. Now I'm going to say that again. These religious leaders, they were the religious leaders of Israel. These were the ones that were charged with caring for the spiritual condition of the people. Do you know how important it is for us as leaders today that have been charged with caring for the spiritual condition of the people to do what God has mandated for us to do? It's necessary. We, we, are, we were on a prayer call the other night. And I'm going to take a little diversion and we're almost done. We are on a prayer call the other night. And um, the women of God were crying out to God, and they were praying, and, and each one continued to go a little level higher. And then there was one that got on the prayer call, and this woman of God began to pray so that when I tell you, you could feel chains breaking. You could feel the heavens open up. You could sense that God was in the place. It's not the day he didn't hear the other prayers. He heard those too. But you could sense that God was shifting something in the atmosphere, and you know the enemy immediately begin to try and speak. And I can hear him talking to her saying, uh-uh, you don't need to do all that. You need to calm down. That's what he does to some of you. When you begin to do those things that God has mandated for you to do and you do them in a spirit of excellence and you do them because you know God said to do it this way and you're minding the very nitpicking things that God told you to do. So it's like Noah building the ark. You've got to get this cubit by this width, by this height. When you are uh, attentive, to the thing, the very thing that God told you to do, how he told you to do it. The enemy of your soul will come in and tell you you're doing too much. And then you try and have a, a conversation with the devil, why I don't even know. And, and talk yourself out of doing the very thing that God has called you to do. That's going to bring, I'm talking about breakthrough in the lives of people. We have got to get to a place 
that as spiritual leaders, we find ourselves not like the Sanhedrin. You can't be leading people astray. Your life, my life, our lives have to line up to a degree that we're showing and leading people to God, not away from him. And Jesus dwelt among them. They couldn't even identify that he was, they couldn't identify with it. You wonder why? Have you ever asked yourself that? God, how come they just couldn't see? If they were the religious leaders leading the people, how, I mean, at least two of them. It says in the commentary, they failed to recognize God as he dwelt among them in the person of his son. Instead of giving him the honor he is due, they condemned Jesus, accusing him of blasphemy and hand him over to Pilate. Now, I realize, don't, don't get me wrong, this is the word of God being, it's been prophesied all this would happen. So I get that. But what I am telling you is that, seem like me, if they were reading the same word that Jesus was quoting from what the Pentateuch, the, the, the five books that Moses had already written that had been prophesied by the prophets before them, if they had that same information... Everything that Elijah and Elias had said, if they had that same information, I'm trying to understand why one of them wasn't in tune. Maybe that's just the way it was supposed to be played out. But let the record show. You've got religious leaders that have been assigned to care for the spiritual being, well-being of God's people right here in the 21st century, leading folks astray. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. It, it is so. You got to say amen. I'm saying to my own self, amen. Once Jesus is handed over to Pilate, Pilate asks Jesus if he is the king of the Jews. This is in Mark 15. And it says that this question indicates the official charge suggested by the religious leaders was that Jesus claimed kingship over the Jews. Now, again, just in my, my, my rational thinking, Somebody had a big ego issue. The man claimed, you know, it's people that can't claim to be Jesus that's walked the earth here um, <laughs> since we've been here. Well, you knew they weren't Jesus. You know they were close to crazy. And it's okay. I get that. But why? I, I need y'all to get on the same page with me. Why? Why would you be threatened by that? Especially if he came performing Signs, wonders, miracles. Why would, you, why would you be threatened? I'm just asking, probe that question. Ask yourself, if the person came in and professed to be Jesus, and, and you were walking in biblical times, and he, they were, he was doing, I can see if he was doing something wrong, but I mean, why would, you, why would you have beef with him as a leader? You ever thought about that? Why would you, why would you have beef with him? Is it that you're not doing it? Are you expecting someone greater? Okay, greater than raising the dead and healing the sick. <laughs> okay, and, and then, okay, your sins are forgiven. I get it. I, I get it to a degree, but it, it just makes you wonder. You're upset because he's saying he's doing all these wonderful things. I've seen him killing folks, but that wasn't what was happening. Ooh, Jesus, help the world today, God. Because we, we got some folks that's really doing some things to lead people astray. But at the end of the day, it says once Jesus is handed over to Pilate, and Pilate asks him all these questions, and Jesus claims the kingship over the Jews. The reason the Jewish leaders would make this charge is the proclamation of himself as king. And therefore, standing against Roman rule would be perceived as a threat worthy of execution. Again, that's where, that's where it lied. It was against the Roman rule. Jesus' response to Pilate's question appears cryptic. He simply answers, thou sayest it. In other words, you said it, I didn't. Jesus did, in fact, see himself as king of the Jews, but it was a different concept of kingship that, than what Pilate had in mind. And this is where we'll end on today. You can't understand spiritual things if you're not in the kingdom of God, if you're not in Christ. It says, Mark cites a custom on the part of Pilate to release once a year a prisoner of the Jews' choosing 
Well, y'all know that he chose Barabbas. They didn't choose Jesus. They chose a person that was a murderer that was doing all the bad things. They didn't choose Jesus. And the crowd demonstrated no concern for the facts at this point. They didn't even want to hear the facts. And they simply continued to shout out, crucify him. But when you study this out, you'll find that it was the religious leaders that began to promote the crowd to yell out, crucify him. So I just encourage you to stand with Jesus. Don't let him stand alone. I mean, y'all, we've got some examples right before us. We don't want to betray him. We don't want to not be able to tarry for one hour. We don't want to run away naked because he went to the cross for all of us. I hope you've enjoyed the lesson on today. God bless you.